Rice checks from Ralston has shown how it can help make nasty mornings nicer. What am I gonna do? <laughs> oh, all right. I say, uh, the, the, the thing I promised to mention you about the Nielsen uh, Jack Parr thing last night, uh, I, I forgot it. It's up in my dressing room. Someone is busily getting it now. So, um, the, the, so stay tuned for that. And Howard Hughes will be here later. <laughs> my next guest is uh, a world traveler. He's probably uh, lived in more countries than most people get to visit, I guess. He's a, known as a, a marvelous businessman, dedicated game conservationist, uh, but probably best known to us for the... Uh, wonderful films he's made. Most of them have been wonderful, some of them have been good, and he said once that a couple of them were lousy. Um, he said that. Will you welcome, please, a man who has a new film, The Revengers, I think it must be about his 50th or 60th film, uh, a wonderful actor, Mr. William Holden. Playing your song. What was all the screaming? Did you forget something? Or I forgot. I'm supposed to have a little piece of paper out here that I don't have yet, and uh, it'll uh, it'll all become clear. It's not your fault, though. You, you haven't like that telephone number you were going to get for me. You forgot that too. Oh yes, a friend of yours. You're going to reveal that on the air. Well, you said that you had a telephone number for me, and then you forgot it. Yes. Now we we better get that straightened out about a friend of yours and a telephone number. Yes, I suppose you'll start claiming it was a male friend now. You get yourself off the hook. <laughs> now, this weekend, a Mr. Beard, friend of yours, yeah, uh, Peter Beard, gave me a phone number to give you and a little note. And uh, I uh, carefully said I would and took it home and stuck it in a drawer. Quite so, a remarkable fellow, Peter Beard. He, he wrote yeah. a book a few years ago called The End of the Game. And now he has three more books being published on game life and conservation in East, East Africa. Yeah. And a uh, remarkable photographer. He's, he's worked for life and covered quite a bit. A wonderful chap. He has some very depressing pictures of, uh, of dead elephants. Um, yes, he did, a, he did a survey this last year. There was a terrible drought in Kenya, in the southeast part of Kenya. And uh, although the official count was something like 4,000 elephants, Peter assured me that it was twice that number. And he surveyed the entire Tsavo Park, Savo East Park, on mm -hmm. and I think his book will be very revealing, uh, not only about elephant life, but uh, also other animals that are endangered there because of drought conditions and uh, the encroachment on their habitat by development of agricultural areas, which all fits in, Dick. You don't mind if I no, rattle on about it? I like that. There's an idea that we had, you know, the hunters that go to Africa for a number of years have claimed that they were really contributing to uh, wildlife because the fees that they paid for licenses uh, went to national parks and maintained game wardens and services like that. For a long time, I've felt that this has been a mistake. Now, this is for trophy, trophy hunting. Hunters who go to shoot the biggest elephant and the largest rhino and the biggest uh, black mane lion I think are doing as much to destroy the animal population as the poachers are. And I tell you why. It's like inviting someone, say you have beef cattle and you've got a large ranch, and you invite someone to come out and they say, now here I've got a herd of 500 cattle. You're allowed to shoot one. Which one he's gonna is he going to shoot? He's going to shoot the bull, the best, one. The yeah. best bull. And so the breeding of that herd automatically goes down. And it's, it's been proven that over the years, the tusks of the elephants in Africa are getting smaller. And the various animals, like rhino, are becoming stunted because the best breeding bulls are being killed off on trophy hunting. Whereas nature kills off the lame and the halt, right. um, right. the trophy hunt. Uh, isn't the number of trophy hunters declining now? I mean, I hear more and more people say, I used to be able to watch game drop, but I just can't anymore because they're so aware of, apparently not enough people are aware of it. Uh, yes, it is. Can't it say is that idea ought to be. It is dropping. People, but, people are going now on the basis of game observation safaris and photographic safaris, which I'll do anything to, to uh, encourage. Now, there is an area for these people who have to be satisfied 
and have to shoot an animal to prove something to themselves, uh, when, like the, the elephants that were endangered this year in Savo, uh, there were plenty of elephants to shoot. Actually, you'd be doing them a favor if you shot them, rather than letting them just die of thirst over a long period of time. There are areas agriculturally developed that, uh, where the animals accustomed to having used that area before will come in and trample the crops of a farmer and just put him out of business overnight. Those, yeah. those animals have to be driven off, like zebra and, uh, and buffalo. That's an example. There are people who are trying to raise beef cattle, and the predator lions are getting them. Those animals have to be driven off, and the only good way to drive them off is through death. They associate an area with death. Firecrackers, loud noises, thunder flashes, and noise, and sirens, and all that won't do it. The job is done by controlled shooting. So our idea is that if the government declares X number of animals to be shot off under control, that the hunters ought to go in and help do that, rather than depending on the game wardens. Yeah. Have you been to these places? They still have them, though, where people, there was an article someone sent me, I, and I've mentioned it before, about a family in Houston, Texas that had such a wonderful time, and their little son was able to shoot 16 animals, eight of them from inside an air-conditioned van, and he was always able to get a Coke. and. Uh, was never never had to get his feet dirty and shot leopards out of trees and well just, I don't think that's exactly true sick. one has to be 200 yards uh, away from any vehicle before you can shoot an animal in East Africa in East Africa yeah uh, in Mozambique and yeah. Angola and some places like that it's different they are different yeah. but I know East uh, East Africa is quite stringent on, on yeah. game control <clears throat> hold for a moment we have I must do something here I have to sell a product right across your lap and now here's a word about a brand new dessert from Jell-O. We were talking about elephants in Africa and all, and all of that. It, you said to prove something to themselves. And some hunters, uh, there's been a theory that a lot of people hunt because it has some kind of disguised uh, sexual satisfaction for people. Um, the obvious uh, symbol of the gun and so on. Uh, but that the actual act of killing something at, at a distance is a kind of... Um, erotic thrill for people, and they, whether they admit it or not. Uh, I'm not so sure that it has a I don't know sexual either, connotation to it, I but I, I, I think, in a way, it's uh, an assertion of uh, masculinity. But, you know, strangely enough, the reaction that happens, now some men go out and they're, they've hunted all their lives, and there was nothing against hunting when they were young. I'm talking about a man about 65 now, but we had a chap that came over to hunt an elephant. He was a Chicago businessman, and he had saved up about 30 years to have his safari in Africa. He went out, he was successful, and he shot the elephant and he came back and I happened to be in the club bar that evening and he was sobbing quietly at the bar. And I was going to say, congratulations, you got your elephant. And I said, uh, what's the matter, chum? And he said, you know what I did? He said, God created this magnificent beast. And he said, I walked up close enough to get one shot into him. And he said, there in front of me was just 10 tons of dead meat. And he packed up his safari and went home. That was one reaction to it. And I was so touched by that. He said, all of a sudden, it was just nothing but tons of dead meat in front of him, mm -hmm. and God had created this magnificent beast. I think if a lot of us who have hunted in the past and might want to hunt in the future can think of that first, then that story would do more for conservation, saving these animals. Yeah. It's something, I don't know how anyone can shoot an elephant particularly, because the, the way it just sort of seems to collapse from the inside, and all that majesty, just like the air yeah. goes out of it, it just falls. It's very it's pathetic. Uh, 